Hello, I'm here today with Dr. Robert Kafer, and we're going to be talking about his new book, which is his fourth book. And I am Polly Young Eisendraff. Uh, I'm a psychoanalyst and a speaker, and uh, I'm interviewing Dr. Kafer because his newest book has relevance for the, uh, some of the things that are going on in the world today, as well as new developments in psychoanalysis. So the book is called Beyond and Thoughts Too Deep for Words, Psychoanalysis, Suggestion, and the Language of the Unconscious. The book came out just recently, uh, at the beginning of 2020, and uh, the publishers were outlage, and it's in a series called the Wilford Beyond Studies Book Series. So uh, good afternoon, Robert. Good afternoon. Uh, so I thought that I would talk with you first, uh, asking you to unpack the title a bit so that listeners can understand uh, maybe a little bit about who Beyon is, if they're not familiar, and even if they are familiar, hearing your perspective on it. And then um, the phrase, thoughts too deep for words, and then we'll look at the subtitle uh, just to unpack that whole thing so that we understand what is in this book that is new and different. Okay, well, first, thank you for, for having me, uh, giving me the chance to say something about my book. Um, the title um, refers to first Wilfred Bion, who was a, a British psychoanalyst who died in 1979 and uh, whom I knew uh, in Los Angeles in the 70s. He uh, was uh, born in England, uh, was uh, educated there, he was trained there, and he was a very prominent member of the British Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. He was president for a couple of years and um, was analyzed by Melanie Klein, and he was one of a cohort of uh, quite brilliant uh, psychoanalysts that Klein, um, that Klein trained uh, and was probably generally regarded as the most brilliant of, of the bunch. Uh, but he moved to Los Angeles in 1967 and practiced there until he moved back to England uh, shortly before he died. Uh -huh. So he's a psychoanalyst who's become very popular in these last 10 years or so among North American therapists, you know, not just psychoanalysts, but people who uh, are interested in psychoanalysis. And I, I believe part of that is because of the second part of your title, that his work and your work, uh, you know, addresses the issue of communication that falls outside of words. And uh, uh, so, you know, you're, you're calling it thoughts too deep for words. So could you just sketch that out a little? That part of the title actually refers to um, two things. One is, uh, is uh, as you say, Beyond's notion <clears throat> that uh, of unconscious communication, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which of course is not is not mental telepathy, but it's communication uh, in in subtle nonverbal ways by body language, by um, um, subtle allusions in the the words that one chooses, by the music of speech, by the tone of voice, uh, uh, things that convey. Um, I want to say information, but that's kind of too dry a word, but things that convey uh, meaning, maybe meaning, em or emotional meaning, emotional meaning, in information about the speaker's emotional state, which is, is picked up quite accurately by most normal listeners. Mm -hmm. uh, Bion had uh, came up with this idea of thoughts without a thinker, uh, which uh, 
is part of this whole concept. Uh, we, we ordinarily think of thinkers generating thoughts. When we think, we make, we create thoughts. Um, he felt that there was a reality uh, that existed independently and that presented us with things to think about, whether we thought about them or not. So the thoughts really precede the thinker. And we can either think about them or not. If we think about them, we can become aware of them. If we don't, they're still there. We just don't know about them. So there are thoughts that come to mind rather than the, what we're thinking exactly. They seem to come to mind. Right. And the, the content of the unconscious in Beyond's view is largely uh, such thoughts without a thinker. And uh -huh. the reason they're unconscious is that they're not thought about, but they could be thought about, but they're not. Uh -huh. It seems to me that there are a lot of people out there who recognize that when they're listening to a speaker or they're, li <coughs> they're listening to an interview like this, that they, they know that what they'll remember will be more tone of voice or how we look at each other than the actual words we say. I find that these days, a lot of people recognize this idea that what's being communicated often is not the words, uh, and the words are the least remembered. Uh, so there are other kinds of meanings that are being communicated all the time. And this book addresses that kind of meaning, I guess. It addresses this kind of bandwidth or, or band of communication. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of uh, the communication that takes place between people on this band is uh, unconscious. That is, neither the speaker nor the listener is aware of what's being communicated, but uh, it certainly does affect how one feels. And may have the biggest impact, like more than the words, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so the subtitle now, breaks the book down into these three components, psychoanalysis, suggestion, and the language of the unconscious. So I, I'm first going to ask you about the language of the unconscious because we seem to be talking about that already. Um, if you could just say a little bit the way you regard the language of the unconscious uh, and how that is communicated or not through you know, ordinary contact or through other things, through the, uh, you know, images and dreams or whatever, I, however it is that you regard the language of the unconscious. The unconscious, I'm, I, I, I agree with, with Freud, who said that the, the ego is, first of all, a body ego, and that the unconscious does arrive, uh, arise, I should say, in the first instance uh, from the body, from bodily impulses, uh, and from uh, fantasies that are the mental expression of those impulses. Um, the, the mode of communication, what, what I call song and dance, body language and, and music of uh, speech and tone of voice, and, uh, um, has a direct bodily impact on the listener that uh, you may not understand how it happens or why it happens, but you end up feeling something as a result of uh, being communicated with on this band by somebody else. And uh, the feelings, emotions are uh, largely experienced as bodily sensations. For example? Well, we uh, have a sinking feeling in the pit of our stomachs. Uh, we, we have a lump in the throat. We say, uh, my heart leaps. Uh, I was uh, uh, breathless with anticipation. Uh, the most vivid kind of language that we use for expressing emotion tends to refer to bodily states. They use bodily metaphors. Metaphors, yeah. I think they're more than metaphors because I think they, they are actually experienced in the body. Uh -huh. And they're good metaphors because they do reflect actual experience. Uh -huh. um, and this is the, the level uh, of uh, communication that I'm trying to sort of uh, winkle out. Talk, talk about in the book, you're, 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 yeah. you're trying. And so those, those metaphors like a lump in the throat or a sinking feeling, um, 
they might be they, they might be close to the picture of an experience that a person is having rather than like a literary metaphor where somebody's trying to convey something although literary metaphors are probably built on those experiences as well well when we talk about um you know even even talking about an intellectual thing like uh, somebody's expressing an idea or a, a notion of something and you say well that really sticks in my craw uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it means more than just uh, I, I don't quite understand it or i don't quite i don't think it makes a lot of sense or i don't it's uh it means you can't swallow it uh -huh. Uh -huh. so that accepting an idea uh, subscribing to it, what we would say in, in intellectual language, is unconsciously swallowing it, taking uh -huh. it inside yourself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That doesn't fit inside me. I, it sticks in my craw. Uh -huh. Meaning, on a, on a conscious level, I don't agree with it. On an unconscious level, I'm not swallowing it. But I think you're saying that the metaphorical aspect of the way that's expressed, like sticking in your craw, is something we can we can say that in language when you mm -hmm. and I are saying it to each other, but that it's experienced kind of physically, and also maybe you know it's like we have words to express it, but the physical experience might be pretty concrete. It might be that you can't swallow then, or that you know there's something that you feel distressed about in your body. Right, and and. You can you can disagree with somebody on an intellectual level, but if it doesn't stick in your craw, then you're not disagreeing on an emotional level. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And and the the metaphor is is important to pay attention to because I think it's related to authenticity. Uh -huh. When you well, say I, I I don't agree, but you don't have that sticking feeling, then maybe you're not being quite authentic. Or you're having an experience that's more intellectual than emotional, perhaps, yeah. you know, yeah. that you're having more of an intellectual argument with somebody. But those emotional experiences that get put into these metaphorical words are actually experienced, I think you're saying, in an, em in an embodied way by most people, and that sort of falls beneath their kind of conscious awareness often that they're having the experience of being hit by something or something sticking in their throat or exactly, they're, exactly. they're not they're not expressing that through words right right and the, the the song and dance band of communication that i'm talking about can produce those experiences those embodied experiences without words mm-hmm uh -huh. It's uh -huh. independent of the words. Uh -huh. And then how about the rhythms, like of people shaking their heads or, or moving together? Uh, you know, the, sometimes, you know, you'll notice that in, uh, in even in conversation, people's tone of voice or the rhythm will be synchronized, and other times it's not. Yes, I mean, there was, there's a very interesting study that I discussed in the book that was done in the, in the 60s. Um, which showed that uh, when two adults are speaking, um, the speaker dances, body movements in, in, in sync with the rhythm of speech, of, of their speech, and the listener does the same thing. So the listener joins in a dance with the speaker. And these, these movements are very subtle and uh, they had to use high speed, cinematography to even pick them up uh, but what was most remarkable about this study is that it it, it held true even if the listener was two days old uh -huh. babies uh -huh. will synchronize their body movements in relation to uh, an adult speaking to them and obviously it doesn't matter what language the adult is speaking but if you take a tape recording of someone speaking and you cut it into little pieces and then reassemble them at random so that these are human voice sounds, but they don't mean anything, you don't get that response. It's as though babies can somehow are programmed to respond to meaningful speech, even though they can't possibly know the meaning of the words at that point, but they pick up on something. And I think that something is, is what I'm talking about.
Well, and they've been listening interuterinely or whatever, you know, interuterine. They're able to hear the mother's voice from about four months of the pregnancy. Right. So they, they, can, they can hear the rhythm in her speech. They're, they're probably synchronized with that rhythm by the time they come out. And so uh, I know that, that it's not just the language of the mother that they synchronize with. They can synchronize with other languages. Is that right? Is that... Right. They can synchronize yeah. with languages they, they, they may have never heard, for example, right. Chinese. Uh, right. So there might be something, you know, uh, about, I mean, there certainly have been lots of theories about human language having some sort of foundational basis across all the species. And it seems that the baby has, who's heard the mother speaking during, you know, the time of the gestation, um, has this capacity to pick up on what's human, I guess, you know, and move to it. Uh, yes, yes. And, uh, and Don, Donald Meltzer, who's a, another British um, psychoanalyst, has a, has a theory that uh, their language is two levels. Uh, one is the level I've been talking about, which is useful for commu communicating states of mind between people. And the other is the language as we've, as we're used to hearing the word, uh, verbal speech, which he says is more useful for communicating about the external world. Hmm. So there's a direct communication between internal worlds using this song and dance. Uh -huh. and communication about the external world, um, the language that we develop using words and, and so on is more suited to that. Well, to yeah. The, the external world. There's probably a lot to talk about in that because no matter what language you use, it is interpretive. And so you can be using a language about your internal world that someone else misinterprets when you put it in words. You know, so it's it's like... A, that whole issue, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, Noam Chomsky and his idea of some fundamental grammar that's a part of the species. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, about John Gottman's research of couples, where he also does a strong close up of the face and then breaks up the, the words they're saying from the movement and the ways the gestures they're yeah, making. Yeah. And he finds sometimes there's no coordination between the words and the meanings of the words and the gestures and the facial expressions that they're making towards each other. So it's a good, yeah. a good way of picking up hypocrisy. Yeah, well, it picks up all sorts of <laughs> misalignments or unconscious, you know, communication <clears throat> is truly unconscious. <laughs> you know, people don't know they're communicating uh, something that's different from their words. So that this is like a whole world of um, ideas about. Uh, communication that falls outside of what we would typically think of as language. Yeah. Um, and if you talk to, there, there are some people who are, someone would say very disturbed, they're psychotic, they'll be talking and they'll be using words uh -huh. and you'll be listening to them, but you end up with a feeling you just don't know where they're at. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You have no idea. And, and uh, because this, this other element I think is really missing. Well, I think sometimes that's true of politicians too. You know, they're not psychotic. They do it on purpose. <laughs> they're doing, well, they're doing something maybe that they, you know, because their speech is so tied to a rhetoric or to some sort of um, persuasion that they're trying to do, that they're unaware that they are communicating other things through their meanings, emotional meanings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where they, it, maybe it's a little like being psychotic because they've said the same things over and over again. And so, you know, when you're looking at them and listening to them, it seems disconnected. You know, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, is something that probably everybody can recognize that disconnect between what someone is saying and what you're experiencing as their emotional meaning. Um, so I want to just then go back to the first part of the subtitle and ask you what you think psychoanalysis is because I know that this is also a big part of the book. And I think it's an important part, particularly for people who in this period of time are just becoming therapists, becoming psychologists, becoming psychiatrists. 
often they, they have the experience that psychoanalysis, or let's say they've heard this because many of them haven't studied it at all, but they've, they've heard that it's kind of an historical chapter that's over. You know, it's like, well, we finished that. That's behind us now. That left us at the end of the 20th century. We've moved on to a whole lot of other things. And I, I think that you bring it up to date that psychoanalysis is something that maybe we just now are beginning to learn about. Like it was, you know, it was started, it was originated, but it's taken time, a little over a hundred years to bring it out. And that it's, that it's got, that there's, there's sort of a, there's something new about your perspective. Uh, well, actually that, what you're, um, what you're uh, bringing up now is why I wrote the book. Uh, because I started off with this idea that uh, psychoanalysis was a thing, that it wasn't just something that someone concocted and, you know, a kind of, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's here one day and gone the other, but it really is about something that's there, whether anybody's talking about it or not. And I wanted to, you know, I was looking around at all the different uh, kinds of things that have supposedly um, replaced psychoanalysis and, and uh, have, have, have rendered it uh, unnecessary. You mean like cognitive behavioral therapy or a supportive psychotherapy or dialectical behavior therapy or you know those kinds of things yeah you can go on and on there, <laughs> right, right. there are dozens of them yeah. right right and many of them have the three letter acronym like <laughs> cbt dbt act yes yes so i didn't believe that I, I thought that psychoanalysis was a thing and so i said to myself well if it is what makes it a thing what makes it different what makes it you know, unique and and makes it so that it really hasn't been replaced by any of these other things. Um, and can I come up with some idea of what that might be that would be practical, and not, not just a theoretical, you know, well, we deal with the unconscious and, you know, so nobody else does and so on, but something that could be used by, by somebody that is doing analysis or not doing analysis and, and uh, uh, asking themselves, well, is what I'm doing really analysis with this patient, which is a question that if you're doing analysis, you're asking all the time, you know, because am I, am I on track? Am I off track? How do I know? So how do you know? Uh, and that's really what I wanted to try and uh, consider that, that question. How do we know we're doing analysis? And how do we know we're not doing something else? So, which is a way of asking what makes it different. And so it, would it be fair to say it's the question of, um, you know, what, what is psychoanalysis that sets it apart from say psychotherapy or any other methods of uh, investigation of the mind? I mean, what is psychoanalysis that's distinct from those other methods is that a fair right question? What, what what makes it distinct but also how do you know you're doing it or how do you know you're not doing it at any given moment at any given moment because mm. um, i wanted it to be in you know valuable in in a practical sense mm -hmm. um and so that's what got me really got me on to eventually the, the idea of unconscious communication that we've been talking about uh, up until now, uh, because it seemed to me that uh, that's where the difference must lie. Uh, and I use the word suggestion, which is kind of an outmoded word maybe, but uh, I really wanted to, to it, it seemed to me that what made psychoanalysis unique was that it, it wasn't suggestion. So what is suggestion? What mm -hmm. do I mean by suggestion? Mm -hmm. And how does suggestion, uh, how is suggestion a part of other therapies or whatever? So what is it? And you know, if you leave it 
if you put it in a particular category suggestion, then you must be saying as a part of other forms of inquiry or uh, intervention on the mental health scene or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I came up with this idea that, that suggestion, uh, and I'm not the only one who's come up with this idea, but uh, that uh, suggestion uh, operates um, by this song and dance band of communication. Uh, that, in other words, it's not what the um, cliche might indicate of, of someone putting someone else into a hypnotic state and telling them that when you wake up, you will feel this or do that. Uh, that's kind of a caricature. But that suggestion, I believe, as I'm using the term, it happens all the time between everybody. Uh -huh. And it's, the in, it's a word that uh, describes the impact of this song and dance mode of communication. Uh -huh. We're always influencing each other's mental and emotional states, uh -huh. uh, sometimes uh, deliberately, and, uh, but usually without even knowing it. Uh -huh. Um, and we're always being influenced. And so, well, unless you're in advertising, I guess, or marketing, there you're trying to do that yeah, yeah. beyond the words you're trying to influence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But we're all selling something, uh -huh. uh, and we're all um, we all have wishes and desires for the people in our lives, and we're all trying we're all, we're all trying to shape these other people and mold them. Uh, the way we want them to be, the way that would be satisfying for us. Um, and um, that's everyday suggestion. And it's very uh -huh. common. In uh -huh. fact, it's uh, universal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I don't think there is a human relationship that, that really lacked the worthy of the name that really, uh, that would lack that element. Well, yesterday, in fact, I read a quote by the psychologist, uh, cognitive scientist, Donald Hoffman, and uh, it's along these lines, he says, uh, you know, for human beings, reason is not the search for truth. Reason is social persuasion. That's the way we learn to reason, is to persuade others of what we believe to be the case. And so that's why our reason is so fallible, because it has this suggestion aspect that's built into it. And a lot of times people think reason sets, you, you know, if you're getting into logic or reasoning or whatever, you're not persuading. And he's saying that the very thing about reason itself, particularly rhetoric and so on, is that it is social persuasion. Uh, well, I mean, D David Hume said reason is the slave of passion, uh -huh, uh -huh. which is usually taken to mean that he's talking about our passions undermine our reason. Right, but it's more of what I think helpless in the about. face of our passions. What he, but what he, what he really said was, re reason is and ever ought to be the slave of passion, uh -huh. and that uh, it was the same idea that uh, you know basically we have passions by which he he meant he was really referring to values, things we believe in passionately, uh -huh. and that we reason in order to. Um, promote those values. So we can't seem to stop uh, persuading and promoting um, our experiences, even if we are trying to be rational and logical. And so the idea, for example, that psychoanalysis, uh, you know, maybe some people's idea would be that it, it's a kind of rational, logical interpretation of your emotional meaning rather than uh, something like persuading you to think a certain way. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, because I know there have been, uh, there have been also psychoanalysts uh, like Donald Spence or Roy Schaefer who would say that psychoanalysis is a rhetoric, but I think you're saying something else. I, I would say psychoanalysis is a, is an attempt to persuade people to think, okay. not to think in a certain way. Okay. But think about, well, to think basically about 
um, what they are doing to themselves and other people on this level of song and dance, this unconscious level, to get them to think about uh, um, the persuasion they are engaged in, the uh, passions that their reason is serving, and what they are, and why they're doing what they're doing, why they are, you could say, um, using their power of suggestion in the specific way they are using it. Uh, uh, previously unconsciously, but you hope at the, at the conclusion of an analysis more conscious than they were before, because that's a way of uh, really finding out who they are. You know, what do you feel? What do you do with people? Why do you do it? Uh -huh. That's a large part of, you know, if you've answered those questions, you've, you've said a lot about who someone is. But then maybe, uh, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, I can do that by myself. I can think about who I am. I know my history. I, I can see what my emotional motivations are. I know what my values are. And so, you know, some people might feel that they can investigate themselves without another person being present. Uh, or, they, you know, the, the flip side of that would be, well, what does the other person do? The other person also has all those same foibles that, you know, in, in her or his reasoning. So how does the psychoanalyst enter into this and why does there need to be one? You know, well, to the, the, the psychoanalyst enters, enters into it because the psychoanalyst um, is, uh, one hopes in the, in the position to observe the pitch that's going on, observe what's being sold by this patient. And this brings us to what's called the transference, uh -huh. because one of the reasons for psychoanalysis to be so uh, extensive and intensive is that the patient forms a relationship with the analyst. Uh, and I won't go into the details of how much of it is is real and or what it even means to be real and how much of it is not real and so on. But the point is, there's a relationship that's formed with the analyst and the analyst is in a position, largely because of the kind of unconscious communication we've been talking about, to observe what's being communicated by the patient, uh, how, they're, how they feel with this patient, what, what's it like to be with this patient? And I don't think most people could say really with very much uh, precision, what's it like to be with them? They can say, oh, I know myself. Uh -huh. But if uh, you were to ask them, well, what's it like to be with you? What's it like to be uh, the, um, the other party in this dance that you do with people? Uh -huh. You know what the dance is. That you uh -huh. do with other people they'd be it's much hard to say what that is but i think without that you really are missing a lot of who you are well it, you could say that you can't even really see your own face i mean you're it's difficult to observe from the other person's perspective yeah. what who you are or what you're doing but then what makes the analyst the psychoanalyst um, you know, sort of a, is that a clean slate of observer? Could, could not be, according to your theory about unconscious communication. That person is also communicating unconsciously. And that, that person also has some passion about conveying a frame of reference or a mode of interpretation or a way of understanding. I mean, is, isn't the psychoanalyst also promoting or selling something? That's a very good question that gets me to the crux of, of what I'm trying to say in the book. Um, but let me just say an, an addendum to, to the last question. Yeah, you can't see your own face and what you get from an analyst, you have your theories about who you are, what your motivations are, what your values are, how you relate to people and so on. If you're seeing an analyst, if you're in analysis, you get a chance to have a second opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's always good to have a second opinion. 
And, and do you have to trust that second opinion to actually make use of it? Or can you feel ambivalent about your trust and still make use of it? I mean, is it, because I think, again, um, people, you know, think about psychotherapy or help in understanding themselves. They think that they have to trust or believe in the right. observer. I think I, the question, yeah. I think the question is, should you trust them, really? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, why should you, if you should? Mm -hmm. um, so, to get back to your your, your question, um, yes, the, uh, the the psychoanalyst being human is pitching, does have uh, his or her own needs, and uh, does. Um, find themselves wanting to shape the patient and wanting to mold the patient in a certain way. And, you know, this can be, speaking of reason, this mm -hmm. can be rationalized as therapeutic. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a professional and I have professional goals. And I think that, um, I don't know, it'd be better if this person were married, or I think it'd be better if this person got a divorce, or I think it would be better uh -huh. if this person had children, or no, this person should never have children. Uh -huh. And that's what would be good for them. Now, I think those are all rationalizations for the uh, analyst or therapist's own desires and own needs for the patient. Uh -huh. What uh, analysts can do and 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 will do uh, if they're trained properly i think what a lot of the training um, what a lot of the training allows them to do is to catch themselves is to get to the verge of wanting to do something to the patient and by do i don't mean necessarily physically i mean verbally as well words have can be actions, words can be ways of making people feel a certain way and so on. Something and, gets and, stuck in your craw or yeah, something yeah. that, you know, those, those actions that you talked about, yes. Exactly, so you wanna do something to the patient, okay? Like we all wanna do something to each other all the time. And to be, become aware before you do it, before you say whatever it is that's gonna act on the patient, become aware of, the fact that you want to do something and you stop you say well what do i want to do and why do i want to do it uh -huh. and instead of doing it you talk about it right right and then that becomes uh an informative conversation in terms of the patient getting to know herself and perhaps the analyst also seeing something about right. herself or himself and that Yes, absolutely. And, and that, that would be a sign of a, of a good analysis that uh, someone once said uh, at, at the end of a good analysis, the patient should be able to get up and shake the analyst's hand and say, thank you, I'm better now. And the analyst should be able to say, you're welcome, so am I. Yes, that's very good. And then, you know, that's a really good place for us to stop. Unfortunately, we, we have to stop because we're, we're on a kind of a schedule here that uh, I'd love to go on talking about this, but I, I think that you've done a, a very good job just in you know, deconstructing the title and the subtitle of giving uh, the reader a sense of why it's an important book and how, and how actually timely it is too. Because at this moment in our larger culture, we're dealing with a lot of suggestion, a lot of polarization, a lot of meaning that gets tossed around in these ways that um, you're describing in the book quite precisely. And my feeling is that psychoanalysis right now at this moment is more important than many other forms of inquiry that are around. And that this is a book to read if you're, if you're in the therapy business, but it's also a book to read if you're, if you're simply in the business of trying to understand the mind. Um, yeah, I think it, it's really the only kind of hands-on exploration of the unconscious. Yes, yes. It's, it's an in vivo. 
Right. Uh, and, and it's like a laboratory in that way that uh, it's an investigation that has actually a framework that makes it uh, somewhat, I would say, more objective than almost any other kind of conversation. And I could put objective in quotes, but what I mean is that it's not just driven by somebody's persuasion, you know, by one person's persuasion. So, um, yeah, it's driven by the analyst's ability, which I think is is a, a, an ability a good analyst has to not be driven right. to persuade. Right, right. To refrain from persuading. So I just want to thank you. This has been a great conversation. And um, I hope that people, you know, will run right out and buy the book. But since we can't go out to buy anything, I assume that this is available on Amazon, Goodreads, Barnes and Noble. Correct, uh, yes. And uh, we'll put the link up. And uh, I look forward to hearing uh, from other people how they've, uh, how they've understood the book and how they're using it. Okay. So thank you. I've enjoyed it too.